Good morning. It's good to see everybody. I'll stand let's worship together this morning. Amen, amen. Morning, church. How we doing? Come on, that sounded too Baptist. How we doing? All right. Good to have you this morning. Welcome to the gathering. There's a text that came out this morning in Psalms 122, I believe it was, that said, I was glad when they said, it's Sunday, and we get to come worship. Amen? Amen. Welcome to the gathering. I'm going to pray, and we're going to get right back into worship after we fellowship a little bit, so say hello to somebody. Father, we love you, and you are the reason we are here. 
We're not here for show. We're not here to, 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 to sing along with karaoke, Father. We sing these songs to you, to the creator of the universe. Father, let us feel worship this morning like we'd never have. Speak to us this morning, Father. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Y'all fellowship. I want to take a minute um, this morning as we go into a time of prayer. Uh, we want to do things a little bit different with our prayer time. We'll, we'll still have our prayer board, um, but sometimes our request, and we're so thankful that you're willing to share and let the church pray with you over need, but sometimes they get up there and we're not sure, like, is this still something we should be praying for? Is this, you know, is there a praise? We appreciate Nani wrote on hers, praise. And so that was great that we were able to celebrate that. Um, and so we're, we have our forms a little bit different, our prayer cards a little bit different. Um, it just has your name and your, your phone number, today's date, and some important info like the date that something's going to happen. And then your request can go on the other side of that. That way we can... We know who to contact if we have questions. It, you know, if we're like, hey, when was this procedure going to be? Or just something like that. It, it'll just help us know how to, to pray better and to meet needs. And so that's our new form. Um, so this morning, as we go into our time of prayer, here's, it's going to look a little bit different. We put our prayer needs that we already have, our little yellow cards, 
they're up here on the stage. Um, and if you would please still come and grab one of those and pray for these needs. Um, but those won't go back on the board. And we're going to have two boards next Sunday, so we're just not bottlenecking. Um, but if you, if you have something that you want us to continue to pray for, if you would fill out one of these forms, then we would. Um, that would be great. It's just a, just a, better, a better system for us to um, have a better way to pray for each of, each of your prayer needs. Okay? So um, Caleb's going to, we're going to begin again to worship and go into a time of worship. If you're willing to pray for some of these needs, if you will come get one of those. On the, on the front of the stage. Thank you. Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves. When I walk in the water, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way. So I So I will not lose heart. Here I will lift my arms. In the darkness into the night, my praise will call the sun to rise. Declare.
All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Again, I'm not enough. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I going to pray this morning, and um, as I as I get ready to pray, I'm ask Peyton and 
his mama to come up here. Um, Peyton's going to be uh, moving away in a couple of weeks. He's going to head down to Lafayette um, to start a new chapter in his life. And I know his mama is very uh, nervous about this, uh, very anxious about this. And so I'm going to pray, but um, Lauren is going to come, and she is going to pray for Peyton. So I'd like to ask if, uh, uh, for those of you who you're part of Peyton's life, you've You've been there and watched him grow up. We watched him, I think he was a first grader maybe when uh, when y'all came to the gathering, first or second grade, yeah? Um, and so we've watched him grow up. And so if you will just join us up here as we pray for Peyton and uh, pray God's blessing over this new chapter in his life. Um, so as I pray, if you'll come up, we'll lay hands, gentle hands on Peyton. And I'm going to pray and then Lauren is going to bless bless this new journey for Peyton. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are just thankful that your your presence is here with us. And um, we we read in the Old Testament about um, you couldn't just, you couldn't just go to you. There was such a process and so many things had to happen and sacrifices had to be made and only the priests could go and and all the all the things, all the details, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are able to come to you and to be in your presence, and we're so thankful for that. And I pray, God, that, that we not take that lightly, but we understand the gift that we have been given. And so, God, I just pray that as we um, sit in your presence, that we have open hearts and open minds, and we hear from you today. And when we hear from you, and when we hear from your word, we cannot leave not being changed. And so I pray that when we leave this place today, that we'll be, we will be changed. And that we will go out and we'll make a difference in this world. We love you so much. We're thankful for this opportunity to be here, to serve you, to make a difference, to be a light. And I pray, God, that you will just guide us. As we as we seek to do your will, we love you so much. In thy name, we pray. Amen. Lord, I just thank you so much for um, such the opportunity to work with our young people in our church. God, it is um, such a big position to be in, and I just pray that as Peyton has grown up in our church, with every single leader that has touched his life, when it was. In nursery, when it was in children's church, as they moved to middle school and to high school, God, that every single role model that was attached to him through our church has impacted his life in such a way that moving away is not making a difference. But it's just making him to be so much stronger and such a bold light for your kingdom because of what he's learned through your word, through your church, through his family that's here. And I just pray that during this journey that Peyton is about to embark on, that um, every opportunity that is given for him to share the word, to learn more about the Lord, that he takes that and runs with it. God, I just thank you so much for such a ministry that we have here in our church and such a focus we have on our kids here. And I just pray that that continues for all of our youth, for all of our kids in nursery, that they're constantly being poured into so that they can, in turn, pour into other people. God, I thank you so much for Peyton, for his life, for what he's doing, and I just pray that every step of college becomes a ministry for him. We know that you have a calling on his life for music, and I just pray that that becomes so evident as he starts every single class, and we thank you for who he is. Protect him and protect his mama's heart. In thy name we pray, amen. morning. Wow, that was bad. So it's not a good morning for some of you. Let's try that again. Good morning. morning. Oh wait, okay that's better. It's good to be, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, right Josh? Amen. Amen. Ought to be uh, excited when when we get to come to church. Um, so I, I, uh, 
few weeks ago, I told you my summer, my summer series was going to be on some things that I wanted to talk about. Um, I didn't really have a specific summer series. It kind of has gone in the direction of the minor prophets, though. So that's what I'm planning on doing for the for the next few weeks uh, is is continue with the minor prophets. I'm actually going back to the book of Hosea. We've talked about Hosea and Amos, and we'll give you a little recap here in a minute. And then on September the 10th, we're going to do just like we did last year, the Sunday after Labor Day, when everybody is finished with all of the different places that we go in the summer, because you have to have to be back because school starts and the kids have to be here. Uh, we had a uh, a back to church Sunday, and we just tried to get as many people as, uh, here as we could on that day, and had a had a special Sunday. So we're going to do that this year again. I think that's the tenth. Is that right? Is that the the week after Labor Day, September the tenth? Uh, and and we're going to talk about uh, we're gonna, we'll start a series that that week, and it's it's going to be about the greatest invention that God ever made. I mean, it's like the top of his list, his greatest invention. It is not Mountain Dew or Mellow Yellow or Bluebell Ice Cream. Those are like two, three, and four, and not necessarily in that order, but uh, his greatest invention is the family, the home. And that's, that's, uh, that's how, he, when he made this world, he said, I made you people to need relationships. And so, and so his greatest invention is the home. And we're going to talk about the family and the home. We all have homes. We all have families. Some of us have people that we're blood related to that are family. Some of us have people that we're not blood related to that we would call our family. And, uh, and we, need, we need those relationships to help us function in this world. We also need those relationships to help us get from this world to the next one to where we want to be. And so we're going to start a series on that. But today, just to give you a little bit of a recap, we've talked about Hosea and Amos. Hosea and Amos were both prophets to the nation of Israel. You remember that, that uh, there, first of all, there was a, a united kingdom that uh, Saul was the king, then David was the king, then Solomon was, was the king. After Solomon, though, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which was still called Israel, that was ten of the tribes, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah, that was two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And so the, the kingdom was split, and, and Hosea and Amos, these two prophets that we've looked at, they were prophets at the, at the same time in the middle of the 8th century B.C., um, and they were prophesying probably, Hosea's prophecy we're going to look at in a minute is probably about 40 years before Assyria conquered Israel, which was in 721 B.C. And so just to kind of, I know... You, you, when we pick up our Bible, we, we read those Old Testament books, and we're like, I have no idea where this all fits in. So just kind of a little bit of perspective. Most of you probably know about Jonah, right? He's the one that got swallowed by the big fish. He's way more famous than the rest of the prophets. Um, I'm not sure he was happy about what made him famous, but uh, Jonah was a contemporary of these guys. Of course, Jonah was a prophet to who? Nineveh. Right. And so well, let me say this real quick. This has nothing to do with my sermon, but Jonah was a prophet not to Israel. Jonah was a prophet to Nineveh. Do you know why Jonah was a prophet to Nineveh? Because God cared about people way back then that were not his chosen people. He always had a plan to save the people of Nineveh and to save the people of America, to save the people that are Gentiles and not, and not just the Jews. So, so they were contemporaries with Jonah. Also, it, during that 8th century B.C., there's the northern kingdom, there's the southern kingdom. The prophets in the southern kingdom during that time, you've probably heard of Isaiah, right? He was a prophet to Judah. He lived in Jerusalem. Um, and you remember Uzziah was the king. When, when he has his vision, it, it says he has his vision, that's, which is in Isaiah chapter 6, when it was, the, it was when King Uzziah died. So, so Uzziah was the king for like 50 years in the during that century, and Jeroboam II was the king of Israel for like 40 years during that century because there was relative peace during that, that uh, 8th century B.C. until 721 when Assyria conquered, conquered Israel. So we have, so that's what's going on, and then uh, um, the other prophet to Judah during that time was Micah, and you guys are probably familiar with Micah a little bit anyway. Micah 6.8 is, is a verse that a whole lot of people 
No, uh, you know, what does the Lord require of you? You guys have probably heard that verse before. And Micah is also the name that a lot of cool people give to their children. Can I get an amen? All right, thank you for that. So uh, that's kind of that's where we are in when we, when we read the book of Hosea. So here's what, here's what Hosea, here's what God told Hosea about Israel in, in Hosea 4, verse 6. He said, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And right after that, if you read that passage, it's, it, it's not that they didn't have access to the knowledge of God. It's not that they didn't have opportunity. Right after that, it says they rejected knowledge. They rejected the knowledge of God, and that's why they were destroyed. Now, let me tell you something that's very interesting. And I mentioned this just a moment ago, but God says, my people are destroyed. It was 40 more years before they were physically destroyed by Assyria. Before Assyria destroyed the nation of Israel and people were dispersed everywhere and never to really come back again as a, as a, a nation. And that was 40 more years, and yet God already said, my people are destroyed. You know why I said that? Spiritual destruction, way worse than physical destruction. Look, if you you want to be a follower of Christ, and you've decided, I'm going to be a follower of Christ, and you get to a point in your life, and you, you have decided, I am going to follow Christ. And then you get to a point in your life where you're like, you know what, I'm doing some things that I should not be doing. I'm doing some things that are damaging my relationship with God. I guarantee you, that is way worse than my toe hurting. You know what I'm saying? I mean, spiritual pain is far worse. And spiritual spiritual destruction lasts forever. Physical destruction lasts for a moment. And when I say a moment, it might be 70 years, but it's a moment compared to... Forever, spiritual destruction is far worse. And and God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In other words, it could have been avoided. They they were destroyed because they chose to reject the knowledge of God. It could have been avoided. Look, I don't know if you believe this or not, but here's what I believe. The best life that you can live is a godly life. You live your life for Jesus. You give your you give your life to Jesus. And maybe you have done that. Maybe you've kind of come to the edge of the water and kind of stuck your foot in to, to see what the water feels like, and you're not really sure about jumping in with both feet. Or maybe you've never you've maybe you've never really tried it because you've looked at other people that claim to be Christians, and you're like, I don't see anything different in their life. I mean, maybe that's maybe that's where you are. Either either you just haven't even tried it because you've looked at other Christians, or maybe you've just kind of Stuck your foot in the water a little bit. But look, here's the deal. Here's what I believe with all my heart. There's nothing better than living a godly life. I've said this before. I heard this phrase from Andy Stanley. Living your life for Jesus makes your life better. And it makes you better at life. And until we believe that, we're just going to kind of float float along, going through the, through the motions of religion. And it's not going to make a bit of difference in our lives. But here is... Here's, here's God telling Hosea, my people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge. They're not living the life that I have called them to live. And then, uh, and, and I, re- I read this verse a couple of weeks ago. The Apostle Peter said this, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. How? Through our knowledge of him. We live a godly knife. Uh, knife. <laughs> We live a godly life through our knowledge of God. And, and I'm repeating this. You guys, pay attention here. Do you know why I'm repeating this from like three weeks ago? The reason I'm repeating this is because knowledge leaks. You remember me talking about that? If you don't, the reason you don't is because knowledge leaks. It, it, we have to be constantly reminded of the things that we know to be true. There's a guy who went to the doctor. He's having, he having trouble with his memory. He went to the doctor. He said, doctor, I'm forgetting everything. I, you got to help me out. I'm having trouble with my memory. And the doctor looked at him and said, well, how long has this been going on? And the guy said, how long has what been going on? Yeah, some of y'all think about that. You'll get it later. Knowledge leaks. And it's, it's a fact. They've done studies. You can learn something right now. And, 50, and, and one hour from now, 50% of what you learn right now is gone. 
And then in 24 hours from now, 70% of it's gone. And one week from now, 90% of it is gone. Knowledge leaks, so we have to do we have to do the same things over and over and over and over again. We have to repeat ourselves. Of, we have to repeat the same truths to ourselves over and over and over and over again. Because here's what happens. If I'm living for God and I'm making progress, I'm being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. And I'm making progress. Well, when I stop repeating the same things over and over and over again, knowledge leaks. So not only do I not continue going, be, continue going further in this direction, I end up going in this direction. It leaks. It goes away. We have to constantly do some things to make sure that we, we are being filled with the knowledge of God. And so I'm going to remind you of some things that I talked about three weeks ago. Here's what you have to do. There's six things. We have to consistently and regularly do these things. We have to consistently and regularly read and reflect on the Word of God. That's the truth. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It's alive and active. It's the very Word of God. It's what God wants you to know. If you're like, oh, you know, I've been praying, but, but I'm not sure what God wants me to do. Are you reading your Bible? Because He already told us a lot of stuff. Now, it doesn't t- he doesn't tell me in there which car to buy, but he gives me a whole lot of other guidelines that are already in there. Are you reading it? We've got to read and reflect on it over and over and over. If you can do it every day, do it every day. If you can't do it every day, you did it today and you missed tomorrow. If you're not getting back into it pretty soon, then you know what's going to happen? Knowledge leaks. Consistently and regularly, we have to read and reflect on the Word of God. We also need to consistently and regularly get before God and be still and listen. And I know there's a lot of people that have these personalities. They're like, go, 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 go. And look, you can pray when you're driving. You can pray when you're, when you're working. You can, I mean, you can pray all day long, and we need to do that. But we need to sometimes just get still before God and say, God, here I am. And, I, and listen. Because God still speaks to us. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, God used to talk to people, but He doesn't anymore. Now, God doesn't talk to me out loud. There's a reason for that. It would scare me to death, and God knows that. He's like, Look, I love you enough, I'm not going to scare you to death, so I'm not going to talk to you out loud. Some people say God talks to them out loud, and, that's, and that's, that's good. But look, the Holy Spirit lives in me. He doesn't have to talk to me out loud because He's already in there. I gotta learn to listen though. And I can't learn to listen unless I get still before God. We also need to do this consistently and regularly. We need to speak out loud what we believe. Romans ten, nine and ten says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, part of that is confessing with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. It's not saying a silent prayer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, preacher gets up, hey, repeat after me. You close your eyes, and in your head, you repeat after him. Have you told anybody that Jesus is Lord of your life? Because if I want to live a godly life, people need to know that Jesus is Lord of my life. And I need to tell them, and I need to speak out loud the things that I believe. You need to speak them in your head, too. But you need to speak out loud the things that you believe to be true. Do you believe that God is able to do infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. Then how come when you have a need, do you really deep down not think that God can do anything about your need? Because we're not, and I'm not, I'm not a name it, claim it kind of guy. I don't think just because I said it, that means it's got to happen. But I do believe that God wants to move in our lives and we got to learn to speak out loud the things that are true. That makes a difference not only in me, but it makes a difference in you. We also need to consistently and regularly Witness others who are living truth. You need to hang out with some people that believe that what the Word of God says is true and they make decisions in their life uh, in response to that truth. You need to hang out with people that do that because it'll rub off on you. We, we need relationships. We need to spend time with people that are doing it the right way. Nobody's totally got it figured out. You know what I'm saying. But we need to spend time with people that love Jesus so much that they're making choices every day that reflects that love. We also need to exercise our faith. We have to make choices sometimes that push us out of our comfort zone. 
You know, we, we need to give a little bit more than we're, than we're capable of giving. And I don't mean monetarily. It may be monetarily, but it may be in any other kind of area. We, we need to go beyond our comfort zone and exercise our faith. We need to every now and then, or maybe a lot of time, maybe every day we need to do this. But we need to do something where we say, God, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to fail and, flaw, and fall flat on my face if you don't help me. We need to live our lives like that. We also need to consistently and regularly express our gratitude to God. That's why, that's why corporate worship is so important. It's a time you can get together and you can express your gratitude to God. Now, you can express your gratitude to God lots of other times, and I hope you do. I hope you drive down the road expressing your gratitude to God and, and just get into this, this place of prayer and you know God is there. If, if you start crying, please pull over. But we need to experience those kinds of things on a regular basis. That's why what we do here is so important. We have to be intentional because knowledge leaks. And Israel did not know God. They didn't know God. And, and, and God said they are destroyed, spiritually destroyed, before they were physically destroyed. They were destroyed for their lack of knowledge. And, and then he says this, Hosea says this too. Here's, here's why they did not know God. It's because they were satisfied. Here's what God told Israel. Hosea recorded it in, 13, in chapter 13, verse 6. When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. Satisfaction really means one of two things. Or it leads to one of two things. It either means contentment or it means complacency. One of those things is good. One of those things not so good. And when we say I'm satisfied, it could mean that we're content. And contentment is good. Paul said that I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance. If I have a lot of money or if I don't have any money. If I'm, if I'm hungry or if I'm well fed. If I'm rich, I'm, I'm poor. If things are going great. If I woke up this morning and I said, woohoo, this is an incredible day. If I woke up this morning and I went, oh, I don't know what's going to happen today, but it just doesn't feel good. You know what I'm saying? Either way, he said, I've learned to be content. There's a whole lot of people. There are a whole lot of Christians in this world that are just grumpy. Like, all the time grumpy. Unhappy. Look, if you are one of those people that are perpetually unhappy, and if you are a Christian, do me a favor. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that you're a Christian because you're not supposed to live like that. Paul said, I have learned to be content. And if you're one of those people that are always unhappy, you Paul know, he knew that some people have trouble with this. So he said, look, you know how? It's like, I, I can picture this. He's preaching this sermon. And he said, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be happy, no matter what the circumstance, where I can spread joy to the people around me. I've learned to do that. And somebody sitting in the audience was like, well, I ain't happy at all. How, and they, Paul how do you do that? And Paul goes, are you kidding me? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Do you realize that's the context of that verse? He's talking to people and he's like, I can be content. Can you be content? How, I don't, how, how am I content? I don't know about you, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Maybe we've been quoting that at the wrong time. Because most people rely on their circumstances to make them happy. We say this, I'll be happy when. And I know, that's a common phrase. I've told you about this before. Stephen Pitch, you've got to work with. Sometimes I just want to slap him because we just make, you know, it's going to be like 104 degrees every day next week, right? We're starting football practice. I'm going to say, man, I'll be happy when it cools off a little bit. And Fitch, you'll say, you mean you're not happy now? I go, oh my goodness. Um, you know what I mean. I am happy. You know what I mean. And so, it, but it's, he does annoy me with it, but it's, I mean, it's a good question because there's a lot of us that aren't happy now because whatever it is that we're waiting for, and we think if this happens, then I'll be happy. Satisfaction is good if satisfaction means contentment. That's not what the Israelites had, though. Satisfaction also means complacency. And Israel was being destroyed for their lack of knowledge because they were complacent. Let me ask you this question. Spiritually, have you ever been at a point where you're like, I am not where I want to be spiritually? I know 
that I am I'm, I'm, I'm far from God at this moment in time. Have you ever been in a place like that? If you've been in a place like that, if we'll step back and if we'll be honest, the reason that we got to that place is because of our lack of knowledge, because we had become satisfied. And some of those things that we should have been doing that we used to do every day or every week, some of those things, we weren't doing them anymore because we got satisfied and we became complacent. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves, when other people look at my life, do they see somebody that is different from the world? Because if other people look at me, and if they don't see somebody that is different, then my faith isn't working. And my faith isn't work. If my faith isn't working, it's probably because I've gotten satisfied. I've gotten complacent. Another word, and I, I don't know what version of the Bible you have, but some versions, instead of using the word satisfied, have the word filled. So it's like I've, I've had enough. I got satisfied with the amount of God that I had. I got filled. I, I, I had enough. And since I got filled, I'm just going to sit here now. You know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, I want to know Christ. And just so you understand what I'm saying, I want to know the power of His resurrection. Wow. And he said, I want to become like Him in His death. How can you become like, like him in his death? Jesus sacrificed everything because he loved other people so much. He loved everybody else more than he loved himself. And Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death so somehow I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. And he said, not that I've already obtained all this. I, I haven't yet arrived at my goal. I, this is, I'm, I'm, I want to get there. And I, every day I get a little bit closer, but I haven't obtained it and I haven't arrived at my goal. He said, one thing I do, I forget what is behind. A lot of us just need to forget what is behind. A lot of us live hanging on to what's behind and what's behind pulls us down and we think we can't get beyond that because it's pulling us back. And the reason it's pulling us back is because we had not let it go. That's a choice that we have to make. But Paul said, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's passion. That's the opposite of complacency. Paul just wanted to know Christ. He wanted to be changed by Christ. He wanted to be transformed by Christ. And you read all of his letters, you're like, I want Christ to fill me with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control like I have never experienced in my life. And I want Him to bring a joy in my life that, uh, that allows me and helps me and causes me to bring joy into the lives of other people. That's what Paul, that's what his passion was. And Paul knew living for Christ makes life better. And it makes you better at life. That was just a little bit of a reminder. It took about 20 minutes for that reminder. But knowledge leaks. We need to be reminded from time to time. Y'all remember the six things we had on the board up here? I, I'll bring them back up later. Maybe not today, but maybe next week. Because we got to do those things if we, wanna, if we want to to retain the knowledge of God. We also talked about this a couple weeks ago, that it's our direction, not our intention, that determines our destination. There's a wide road, there's a narrow road. Amos talks about, talks about this, this concept, and we looked at, at a place in Amos, but uh, you know, the, the wide road is the path of least resistance. And Jesus said, most people go down the wide road because it's easy. But there's a narrow road, and Jesus said, that's the road that I want you to be on because the narrow road takes you to where you really want to be. You might not even know that's where you want to be, but when you get there, you realize, oh, that's where I want to be. So what is your preferred destination? You know, what do you do to take your life in the direction that you really, really want to go, that you really need to go? Let me ask you this. What are the boundaries that keep you on the narrow road? That's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. So I'm going to look quickly had a passage of Scripture in Hosea. I'm just going to read through this, and we'll get to the last verse, and that's the one we're going to talk about. But Hosea chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you Israelites. Listen, royal house. This judgment is against you. 
You've been a snare at Mizpah, a net spread out on Tabor. What he seems to be talking about here is to the leaders. The leaders have like have have taken everybody with them, like like catching an animal in a trap. And we got your trap. Now you're following along in the wrong direction with the rest of us. Verse two: The rebels are knee deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Uh, the um, so. Uh, they went to worship. You guys realize that? They, they, they went and sacrificed. They pretended like they were following God. God's like, you're not fooling me. I, I know what's going on. Uh, Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. If you've never read the book of Hosea, it's interesting. God told Hosea, the prophet, to marry a prostitute. He said, because that's what my nation is like. And, and Hosea married the prostitute named Gomer. He had children with her. And the children he named were prophecies. That in, in their names were actually prophecies. And so after he was married to her for a while, she left him. And she went back to her old job again. And he went back and got her. This, this is a, a prophecy about the destruction of Israel. But at the same time, it's God saying, do you realize how much I love you? Just look at the life of Hosea because that's a picture of how much I love you. So Hosea went back and she was, she was living that life again. And he paid money. To buy her back and took her back, brought, him, brought her back into his home and loved her just as if she had always stayed true to him. Because that's how much God loves us. Verse 4, their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. By the way, that verse, the deeds do not permit them to return to their God. When, I, when We looked at Amos, we said this, one choice leads to another choice, which leads to another choice, which leads to another choice. And that's how our deeds don't permit us to, to make the right decision. We can just keep making the choice, going down the, the, the wide road, and eventually all of those choices make it next to impossible to realize, you know what, all I have to do is turn around and repent. Moving on, Israel's arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. Judah also stumbles with them. When they go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, they will not find Him. Once again, I said they were still worshiping. They were still taking their flocks to the temple and worshiping. He has withdrawn himself from them. They're unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. When they celebrate their new moon feast, he will devour their fields. Sound the trumpet in, in Gibeah. I'm not sure how you say that one. The horn in, in Ramah. Raise the battle cry in Beth Avon. That may be another name for Bethel, which is where they worship the golden calf. Lead on, Benjamin. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning. Among the tribes of Israel... I proclaim what is certain. And then verse 10. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones. Now, boundary stones back in ancient time, one of the worst things that you could do is move a boundary stone because that, that was what marked your property and the next person's property. So if you moved a boundary stone, you were like the worst of all people. You were taking something that was not, that was not yours. You know, back, you, anybody like Westerns? Anybody like John Wayne? Come on now. I watched a little bit of a John Wayne movie yesterday. It's pretty good. In the old westerns, what do they do to horse thieves or cattle thieves? They string them up, find a rope, right? That's the kind of person that you were if you moved boundary stones. Now, metaphorically speaking, what you do when you move a boundary stone, you enlarge your territory. You're chasing after your own desires. You're taking something that is not yours. You are ignoring boundaries. And so... So I think when he says this in here with Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones, I think what he's saying is this. There were some boundaries that I have given them to live by, and they have moved them. They've said, I don't want to, to abide by these boundary stones that keep me on the narrow road. I want that over there. And so they have moved the boundary stones. It's like accepting things that at one time you didn't accept. It's like doing things at one time that you thought you never would do. It's like, I'm really not interested in truth. I really don't want to know what Scripture... And look, there are a whole lot of Christians that don't really want to know what the Scripture says about their specific circumstances in life because they've already decided the decision that they're going to make and they don't want the Bible or anybody else to tell them something opposite of the decision that they've already made. And so what we do a lot of times is we try to get the Bible to support what we're already going to do. Because we don't have a boundary stone. Or we've moved a boundary stone. So, that's what I want to talk about just for a few minutes. 
Then I'll be done. You're like, oh, man. I'm starting my sermon now. Just kidding. There are things that we need to do, and we've talked about those. If you want to live a godly life, you know, Peter said, <clears throat> we live a godly life. God's given us everything we need to live a godly life through our knowledge of Him. If you want to live a godly life, there's some things that you need to do. There are also some things that you need not to do. And I don't mean a list of rules. What I mean is this. I mean that if we're going to live the way God wants us to live and experience what God wants us to experience and really know that living for Christ makes life better and it makes us better at life, if we really want to live that way, we have to make a decision. Not a list of rules, but we need to have some things in our life where we decide, this is my boundary stone because, because staying inside that boundary stone makes me closer to God. And I don't want to go outside of that boundary stone because when I go outside of that boundary stone, I am, I am getting further and further away from God. Not a list of rules. I'm not going to give you a list of rules that if you do this, you're going to get into heaven. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having some things in our life. We've made the decision. I'm not going to do that because that is not going to bring me closer to God. It's not going to give me more of a knowledge of God. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And so I just want to give you, I, I do not have these on the screen because I don't want you to write down my boundary stones. But I sat down and I just kind of jotted down some things that I hadn't really ever even thought this through. And I'm, I'm going to give you 10 of mine real quick that are boundary stones that I live by. And, uh, and I'm going to encourage you to think about your life and write down your own boundary stones. So here are some of my boundary stones. One is this. Here's, here's some things that I don't do. I don't make lust easy. And let me explain what I mean by that. I've heard a whole lot of men, I've heard, of, I've heard a whole lot of Christian men that say, I'm just a red-blooded American man, and there ain't anything you can do about it when you see a woman that's good looking, you're just going to lust, because I'm a red-blooded American man. I don't know what the color of our blood has to do with anything, but let me tell you something. I learned this a long time ago, and I've told you this before in the past. Let me repeat it again. Some of you maybe have never heard me say this before, but I developed this. This I should like, uh, I don't know if you can patent this or not. I, sh I should try though. Maybe I can make lots of money. But I developed this technique to get lust out of my life. I developed this technique. If you do this, I promise you, if you have a problem with lust, this technique will transform your life. Here's what it is. If I'm looking in this direction right here, and I see so I'm going to look at my wife while I do this because it's okay for me to, to have thoughts about my wife. So if I'm looking in this direction and I see something that is going to cause me to lust, and you know what causes you to lust, some of you need to stop watching the commercials on TV. You know what I'm saying? If I'm looking this way and I see something that's going to cause me to lust, check this out. I developed this method. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, watch this. It's not even difficult. I can do it over and over and over again. But so many people go, oh, I'm, I'm just a red-blooded American. I can't help it. You know, you know why you're saying that? Because you don't have a passion for Christ. You're not like Paul. Paul said, I want to know Christ. I can't get close enough. I'm going to do everything I can to have this knowledge of God and to become like Christ. And some of us aren't even willing to do this. Instead, we make excuses. That's one of mine. It's one of my boundary stones. I don't make lust easy. I also don't hold a grudge. Now, this one's not always easy. I, sometimes this, this takes a lot of conversations with God. But I decided a long time ago, that if you have done something to hurt me, you are not going to control my life. Because it, do, it doesn't even, if you've done something to hurt me, odds are it doesn't even bother you. You might not even know that you've done something to hurt me. And I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to allow you to control my life. You can cheat me out of money. You can talk bad about me. And, he, and he, I decided this a long time ago. When I see you, I want to shake your hand. I'm going to look you in the eye. And I'm not going to hold a grudge. It's a boundary stone. I just made that decision a long time ago. I also made this decision. It kind of goes along with that one. I'm not going to get even. 
I mean, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go hold a grudge, but I am going to get even. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get even. As a coach, as a coach, look, I, I used to coach middle school football, and there are times that this happened. We had seventh grade game, then an eighth grade game. I've, just about three years ago, we played a seventh grade team, and they ran the score up on us. They said, we're going to score as much as we possibly can, and they did. We weren't that good. They scored a whole bunch. In that eighth grade game, we were way better than they were. The eighth grade game came second. And I guarantee you, all of these parents in the stands were wanting us to score as much as we possibly could score, and we did not. You know why? I don't get even. Now, that's just, I have decided that a long time ago. If I have a chance, if you pull out in front of me on the road and I'm driving, and I have the chance to get in front of you and slam on my brakes and go slow, I'm not going to do it. I just, that's a boundary stone. And let me, let me tell you, that's enough. Both of those last two, sometimes I got to pray about it a lot. But I have made the decision, that's a boundary stone. I'm, I don't get even. Here's something else. I, I don't use offensive language. Now, when I say this, I, uh, let, let, me, let me clarify. Most words do not bother me. There are some words that bother me. I'm not going to tell you what they are. They probably bother you too. Most words do not bother me. And like, if, 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 and this is one that I can't always do because some people are offended if you say something like, oh, shucks. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, good grief. But anyway, uh, but, but for the most part, I, see, I decided a long time ago, like when I had kids, um, I used to say, I, I'm just going to say this one. I used to say the word crap. Now, I'm just, this is just an illustration here, okay? So don't be offended by me saying that word to tell you that I try not to offend people because I may just offend people trying to tell you that I try not to offend people. Anyway, but I used to say that word, and then I had a son. And I thought, do I want him saying that? Do I want Caleb saying that in front of adults? And I'm like, probably not. So, uh, and that word, you can say that word, does not bother me at all. But I, I just decided I'm not going to say that. Now, I might say some words in some circumstances that I wouldn't say in other circumstances because I don't want to offend you. And if, if you need to be offended, and there's, there's sometimes we all need to be offended, I want to offend you with something that's really, really, really worth offending you over. And so, I try not to offend people with my language. Don't get me, don't get me wrong, I'm not usually offended. But I just don't want to offend you. And so, I probably should have thought that out better before I offended you by explaining. Anyway. Um, moving right along. I'm hurrying. How many is that? Okay. Um, I don't have very many reasons for missing things that I believe are important. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, for example, I don't, I don't miss worship very often at all. And if I do, I'm not, this, I'm not legalistic about this at all. Okay. I am not at all legalistic about what I'm saying, but I don't miss worship. If there's a, if there is a, a, a reason um, that will, will take me out of a, out of a worship setting, it, I have thought through that reason a lot, and I have decided, okay, in this situation, I'm going to miss worship. I don't miss my discipleship band unless I absolutely have to. I have gone to my discipleship band. At 6 o'clock in the morning after having just a few hours of sleep. And I've drug my tail into that discipleship man. But I, I don't miss it. Because I think it's important. And would it be okay for me to miss it? And every now and then I do miss it. But would it be okay? Absolutely it would be okay. But I've decided a long time ago that I'm not going to have very many reasons for missing things that I believe are important. I don't miss my, uh, my kids' ball games. You know, there's a, I've seen it. I've coached for a long time. I've seen so many parents, so many dads that will... They'll, they, they're going to be at the hunting camp and they're going to miss their kid playing, playing ball. I'm like, are you kidding me? At some point in time, you're, you're going to go, you know what? I don't really even care anymore about hunting. And it's going to be too late to go to your kids' ball games. So I don't miss things that I, that I would tell you are important. I don't have very many reasons for missing things that, that are important. That's, that's another boundary stone. Here's another one. I don't stand, I don't take a stand when I should take a seat. Now, I'm not always perfect with this, but that's kind of a concept I try to live by. I don't take a stand when I should take a seat. In other words, there's some things that are not that important. 
Okay, if you if you do not believe the same way I do about some secondary doctrines, I'm perfectly okay with that. And I'm not going to tell you that you're an idiot and you're going to die and go to hell if you don't believe the same way I do about predestination or eternal security or speaking in tongues or whatever those those things are that divide so many people. I'm not going to make a big deal about about those kinds of things. I'm not going to take a stand on something when I should take a seat on that. For example, at Christmas time, there's so many people... Christian people get up in arms. They didn't say Merry Christmas to me. I can't believe that. that I'm not going back to that store. That store, they don't, they tell them, they can't say Merry Christmas. They said Happy Holidays. Guess what? Do you know what holiday means? Holy day. What holy day is in December? Christmas. So when they said Happy Holidays, you know what they said? Merry Christmas. They just didn't know it. You know, there, there's some Christians who are like, we're not, se- we're not going trick-or-treating because we don't celebrate Halloween. I don't cel- celebrate Halloween either. I celebrate getting candy. I mean, good grief. There's people giving out candy. We're going to do it because you can't do it and be a Christian. Go get candy. Anyway, I don't take a stand when I should take a seat. And I also don't take a seat when I should take a stand. Sometimes we just need to sing Tom Petty in our head. You know what I'm saying? No, I won't back down. Sometimes we need to not back down. In our culture, the church has backed down in a lot of ways. Do you know that Roe versus Wade getting turned over? That was incredible. But do you know what happened for the previous 50 years or whatever it was? Is us Christians sitting around complacent about the fact that abortion is legal and, and our country's killing babies. Now, I realize we had to get the right Supreme Court there to get it to turn around. But we get lulled to sleep on that kind of stuff. And we start voting for people that, that support abortion. And the reason that our Supreme Court was not able to overturn it until just recently, because for 50 years we voted for people who support abortion, who put Supreme Court justices in there who support abortion. And so we think, oh, it's just like any other uh, uh, p- political idea. I mean, there's all these, all these uh, different uh, political statements that people make and the stances that they make. You got, you got people making st- uh, statements on abortion. You got people making statements on the climate. You got people making statements on the economy. It's just one other. No, it's not just one other. It's life. We are in our culture. We've redefined marriage. H- how does that happen? Because we we get complacent. There's sometimes we need to. <laughs> that was really not. That, that was a bonus there. We. So yeah, I don't take a seat when I should take a stand. Here's another one. <laughs> I know I'm going long. I'm in a hurry. I'm really hurrying. But but this is really good. I don't. Here's another one. I don't make my choices based on your choices. I've seen that so much, especially parents. Like, I'm gonna let my kid go hang out. I'm not. He's 16. How can I tell him what he can and can't do? Are you kidding me? He's 18. How can I? He carries around a cell phone that I pay for. You know what I'm saying? He lives in my house and I feed him. I don't care if he's 25 living in my house and I feed him, which he better not be. But if he's 25 living in my house and I'm feeding him, I'm telling him what to do. I don't, I, I don't watch, I don't watch TV shows because all these other people tell me how great they are. I don't go to a movie because all these people tell me how great that movie was. There's a whole lot of Christians that are going to movies that are filling their minds with stuff that don't need to be there. I don't make my choices based on your choices. Not you specifically. I mean other people. Not you because you make good choices. Right? I mean like uh, those other people that make choices. That's another one of my boundary stones. Here's another one. I don't hold on tightly to money. You can cheat me out of money. And I told you I don't hold a grudge. But I don't hold on tightly to money. I'm not going to make decisions based solely on money. And if I have a lot of money or if I don't have a lot of money, I'm, just, I'm not going to hold on tightly to money. I made that decision a long time ago. And here's number 10. I don't make major decisions without asking God what I should do. 
a whole lot of people that do that. I do, if, I'm not going to go spend however much it costs on a new car without praying about that because that amount of money represents money that God has given me and God wants me to bless others with what He has given me. And so I'm going to pray about whether or not I should buy that vehicle. I don't just go and go, hey, this is what I like. This is awesome. This is cool. How much can you get my note down to? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask God, and and I'm going to do my best to try to discern what he would have me do. So I have boundary stones. I didn't write those on the board because I don't want you to have the same boundary stones as me. Maybe some of those you want to go, oh, you know what? That is already a boundary stone, or I'm going, to, I'm going to make that a boundary stone. But here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to think about your life and think about what are the boundary stones that you have in your life. What are are the are the things that you're like this, this is I'm going to live by this. And let me ask you this question. How easily how easily are those boundary stones moved? Is there an area in your life and you would admit today as the worship team comes back, if, is there an area in your life and you admit today that this area is not pleasing to God? The reason that you have that in your life is because knowledge leaks. And if I'm not intentionally intentionally going in a in the the right direction i'm going to end up going backwards it's just the way that it happens knowledge leaks and so the way that we keep from knowledge leak to keep our knowledge from leaking we have to do two things we have that's to be some things that we do there has to be some things that we don't do and so we have to have we have to have those six things I gave you earlier. We have to have things in our life. Like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it over and over and over and over again. And then we have to make decisions where I'm not going to do this because I know if I live my life doing this and pushing this stone out of the way, it's going to take me further and further away from God. So do you, do you have an area of your life that is not pleasing to God? Let me ask you this question about that area. What boundary stone have you decided on in that area? If you have a trouble with lust, there's a lot of men, there's a lot of Christian men, Christian men that struggle with pornography. Let me just give you this one example. A lot of Christian men struggle with pornography, and the reason they struggle with pornography is they have not set up a boundary stone. Let me tell you a boundary stone to set up. Get your phone connected to your wife's phone where she sees everything you look at. Because if you're not willing to do that, you don't hate your sin enough. You know what I'm saying? We have to set up boundary stones, and they have to be we, we they have to be stuck in place, immovable. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push them out of the way. So what do you have in your life? And you're like, you know what? This is not pleasing to God. Where's your boundary stone? You need to set up some boundary stones. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. We all, we all need to hear this. I need to hear this. God, reveal to me if there's an area in my life where I need a boundary stone so that I can be more godly, so that I can be closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, um, I invite you to come down and pray. If you'd like for somebody to pray with you, you can come over to this side and somebody will pray with you. If you'd just like to come get down on your knees and say, God, here I am. Whatever it is that you want from me, I want to do that. And I invite you to come down as we sing.
vencer. We have a couple of announcements today. I have a couple of announcements. Um, so we start VBS this week on Wednesday. So we have Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning. We have uh, we will be having VBS. If you have not registered your children on our app, if you would please do that, that would be helpful to us. So get on the app, and I know Lauren's got an app announcement, so I'll let her do that. But VBS starts. If you are a VBS volunteer, if you could meet up here after the service for just a few minutes for a quick meeting, that would be fantastic. Okay? All right. Oh, and so then next Sunday, as we wrap up VBS, we'll be in here. We'll have a, our, our service. And then when we are when we finish our service in, uh, here at a regular time, 1030, regular service, then we will go grab lunch wherever you want to and then come over to Totally Tumbling on Cypress Street. And we will have a fun time, a fellowship. And that's not just for people with little kids. That's everybody. There's a big place for us to sit and enjoy fellowship and lunch together. So it's just a, a good way to celebrate as a church family. And the kids do have a big place that they can play. So um, be ready to celebrate with us on Funday Sunday, next Sunday. I feel like I'm a DJ or something. Okay, so at the bottom there are all the sermons, and I've split them into different categories to according to what Pastor Tim has been talking about, and you've got access to them right now. You can take notes, you can download them and share them with someone else that you think might need to listen to that or someone who missed. You can show them where it is through that. We've gotten so many people connected to all of our messages and groups, and I'm so excited for that. Um, we, If you haven't been a part of that or you're like, oh, man, I think I'm missing out on one of those, when you do click on the messages and you're looking through, there's a part where you can do, go and discover all of the ones that we've created for you. And if you would like to be a part of one that you're not a part of, you can just go request and we'll let you in. Um, because it's a lot of people to go through. So if we've missed you, I promise you it's not on purpose. It's not like, mm, I was really wanting to leave Mike out of that message because I don't like him. Um, no, it's just so many people that you have to include. And so I don't want anyone to not be a part are not getting the information that they need. Now, the last one that I want to tell you is that we are starting um, to have what we're calling Second Saturday Second Saturday Serve. Second Serve? 
Is that right? Second Saturday serve. So that means that the second Saturday of every month is going to be our Saturday of service as a church. And so we're working to get all of our normal outreach projects that we do on the same Saturday. So that's the food bank, the Simple Project, and the foster closet that we're working to all get on the same one. So the Simple Project is going to be on its own schedule for a little while till January. But I have it on here for you on your app where you can go and look at the second Saturday serve. And it gives you the information for the time and all the things. And you can let us know where you're going to serve through here. So that you can, you can be a part, you can see what's happening, what you might want to be a part of. Because you don't have to serve in the same one every single time. You can switch it up. But the fact that it's all on one Saturday, you're not, it, I don't mean this to sound in the wrong way, but you're not filling your entire schedule with, I've got to be here on this Saturday and here on this Saturday and here on this Saturday. But you have one full day where you can serve in so many different opportunities. And then you can use those other days to fellowship and, and serve your family and serve with other people and and I think that's awesome. I don't know about y'all, but I like everything on one day. So it makes me happy. So um, anyways, I just wanted to let you know that both of those things are available on the app. The sermons are on there. And if you're looking around and you're like, hey, I don't see this, or hey, I need an announcement to be added to that, please let me know, or please let Miss Angela know, and she'll let me know um, so we can keep everybody up to date and everything on the app up to date. I hope you love it. I'm, I'm really loving it, and it makes me a little bit nerdy and excited about the, about it. Um, so anyways, we're so glad that you came today. Um, if you are a youth leader, don't forget that we have a meeting after church today. Um, everyone else, if you would just please stand and let's sing another song of worship. We are supposed to announce a simple project. So if you're, there is an announcement on the ladies group. So if you're not a part of the ladies group and I need to add you, let me know. But Ashley has already posted an announcement on there for how we can serve the simple project. Please stand while we sing. Thank you. 